Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ream Library. My name is Tom Landon. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and I'm happy to welcome you here. The McFarland Center sponsors and supports programming that explores uh, basic human questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. This afternoon's talk is one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. We're grateful to the Deitchman family, John Deitchman, in the class of 1970 for the support that makes it possible. Uh, you can learn more about our programs and find recordings of lectures, including this one in a few days, at a holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Today I'm really pleased to welcome Professor Kathy Caveney, a legal scholar and moral theologian, to speak on forms of prophetic speech, the risk that they will mostly be divisive, and the ways that they can be effective. Kathy's working on a new book, Prophecy Without Contempt, An Ethics of Religious Discourse in the Public Square. So this talk will give us a sneak peek of what's coming in that book. She joined Boston College in January. When we first were talking about this talk, she was at, teaching at Notre Dame, and then she was at Yale when we were after that, and then she was at Boston College. So a lot of moves recently, but um, uh, she's the Daryl and Juliet Libby Professor and the first holder of that chair to teach in the law school and in the Department of Theology. Prior to her appointment at BC, as I said, she was a John P. Murphy Foundation Professor of Law and Professor of Theology at Notre Dame. And she's also held visiting professorships at Yale, Princeton, University of Chicago, and at Georgetown. Kathy's author of an award-winning book, Laws of Virtues, Fostering Autonomy and Solidarity in American Society, which was published in 2012. She's a regular columnist for Commonweal Magazine and has authored more than 100 journal articles and book chapters specializing in law, ethics, and medical ethics. She's president of the Society of Christian Ethics, and she's served on several editorial boards. Kathy is frequently interviewed by media outlets that, and has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, National Catholic Reporter, and most importantly for some in our audience on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. So please join me in welcoming Kathy Caveney. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be at Holy Cross. Uh, my dad spent some years growing up in Worcester, so it's nice to be back here. And it's a delight to be back on the East Coast, which is home, because I myself grew up on the other end, well, sort of halfway on the other end, near Woonsocket in Cumberland, Rhode Island, of 146. So... I feel like I'm coming home, and uh, let's see, where did ah, my talk? It would help if I had a talk to give you. So um, what I'm talking about here is actually a book I've been working on in one form or another for almost uh, a decade, uh, thinking about how we should speak to one another, we can speak to one another in, in a religiously um, inspired way in the public square in the American context. So this is a slice of, of that book. I'll just take a sip of water first. Okay, I guess that'll work. Okay, in a sermon he gave a couple of years ago, Father Raniero Canta La Mesa, OFM Cap, the preacher to the papal household, reflected upon various ways in which Christians might contribute to the political common good. He reminded his listeners that Christians not only have an obligation to pay their taxes and to advocate for just policies that promote the family, defense of life, solidarity with the poor, and peace. They also, he said, have a responsibility to act as leaven in the conversation itself. According to Father Cantala Mesa, and I'm quoting, Christians must help remove the poison from the climate of contentiousness in politics, bring back greater respect, composure, and dignity to the relationship between parties. Respect for one's neighbor, clemency, capacity for self-criticism. These are the traits that a disciple of Christ must have in all things, even in politics said Father Cantala Mesa. And he continued. He said, it is undignified for a Christian to give himself over to insults, sarcasm, brawling with his adversaries. If, as Jesus says, those who call their brother stupid are in danger of Gehenna, 
hell, what then must we say about a lot of politicians? Hmm, interesting question. With all due respect for Father Cantala Mesa, however, my suspicion is that his advice was far better received in the city-state of the Vatican, which is, after all, a non-hereditary elected monarchy ruled by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, than it ever could be in the United States. Why is that? Well, first, the population in the United States is significantly more pluralistic than in that of Vatican City. The lack of a common culture, common background, and common sensibilities creates the possibility for misunderstanding and conflict. Second, while Americans do, I think, agree in general terms about the importance of, as Father Cantela Mesa pointed out, the family, the defense of life, solidarity with the poor, and peace, there is significant disagreement in America about what commitments to these values means in concrete cases, as are seemingly endless arguments about gay marriage, about abortion, about health care reform, about progressive taxation, and the wars in the Middle East demonstrate. And third, the root Christian heritage of the United States is not, in fact, Roman Catholic but rather a particular strand of English Protestantism known as Puritanism. Here's the Cliff Note version. In 1630, a band of Puritans set out for the New World in order to free themselves from the corruption of the English church, which they saw as re retaining too many Romish inventions. So when the Puritans are talking about purifying themselves, Functionally, they're talking about purifying themselves from Catholic influences. So it's not just that the country was founded by kind of a random band of Protestants. It was founded by a band of Protestants that were not too fond of Catholics. Their goal, and this is in Massachusetts, was to establish a city on a hill, a new Jerusalem, a polity whose total structure through its correlated political and religious governance accorded with God's holy law. You have to admire them. They risked life and limb. They risked fortune to come over to cross, you know, the Atlantic Ocean on these tiny little ships. And when they got to the end of the long voyage, they couldn't just, you know, put themselves down in a Marriott, you know, and rest for a few days. They had to build the whole community. And they did this because of the God they were so dedicated to in the vision of um, uh, of moral uh, rectitude before God's eyes, they felt called to. But human nature being what it is, that initial fervor didn't really get passed down through the generations. The initial religious fervor of those making the trek to America wore thin, and it was sometimes insufficiently ignited, they thought, in the children and the grandchildren of the initial settlers. It's not all that different from today, right? You know, people look at the children and the grandchildren, the next generation and the next generation, and say, you don't have the same fiber that they had of old. Well, people have been saying that of old for a long time, and the Puritans said that about their grandchildren. So to remedy this situation, Puritan clergymen availed themselves of a particular form of preaching that came to be known as the Jeremiad. As its name suggests, the Jeremiad recalls the urgent call to moral repentance found most strikingly in the prophet Jeremiah, but also in other prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament. Now, what's important to think about is that the Jeremiah is not merely a form of political and religious rhetoric that belonged to the second generation, third generation Puritans. It has been appropriated over the years by a number of different groups in America and used for a number of different purposes. In short, American Jeremiads, American prophetic rhetoric, is not the ideological property of any one group. 
The fiery tones of prophetic denunciation were used by abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison and African-American activists such as Frederick Douglass. But they were also employed by pro-slavery preachers and segregationists. The prophetic rhetoric of uh, the Jeremiah has been used by the socialist Eugene Debs and by the communist hunter Joseph McCarthy. And in our own era, in the past 40 years, you've seen it used by political liberals. Think about the denunciations of the Vietnam War, the Berrigans, and political and religious conservatives. Think about the, the rhetoric around uh, the pro-life movement. So the Jeremiah is no one group's property. It's a form of rhetoric that's American, and various uh, causes and groups fit themselves into its framework. And it's important to remember that it's been around, not just in terms of the Puritans, but in America as old as the, as, as the settlement itself. Uh, one example I like to use so that we don't have this starry-eyed notion that our rhetoric today is somehow more fiery and combustible compared to what it was then is uh, our second president of the United States, John Adams, and how he talked about the pamphleteer Thomas Paine, who wrote the pamphlet, as I'm sure you know, Common Sense, and another book called The Age of Reason. Adams viewed Paine's radical democratic ideas as dangerous and his deism as foolhardy. And he made that opinion abundantly clear in his comment on Paine's pamphlet, The Age of Reason. And not incidentally, Adams' rhetoric denunci denouncing, uh, den yeah, denouncing uh, Paine competes with Paine's fiery rhetoric itself. So let me read you this passage from Adams. I am willing you should call this the age of frivolity, as you do, and would not object if you had named it the age of folly, vice, frenzy, brutality, demons, Bonaparte, Tom Paine, or the age of the burning brand from the bottomless pit, or anything but the age of reason. I know not whether any man in this world has had more influence on its inhabitants or affairs in the last 30 years than Tom Paine. There can be no severer satire on the age. For such a mongrel between a pig and a puppy, begotten by a wild boar on a bitch wolf, never before in the age of world was suffered by the poltroonery of mankind to run through such a career of mischief. Call it then the age of pain. So our stuffy second president of the United States knew how to throw, throw the verbal darts with the best of them, denouncing prophetically and also quite, you know, uh, colorfully someone whose vision he felt was fundamentally opposed to what was good for the United States. So I'm trying to help figure out how we can think about this kind of rhetoric in this talk. Its title is Prophecy, Civility, and Truth. Even a cursory glance at the prophetic books reveal that they don't comply with Father Cantalamesa's call to bring back greater respect, composure, and dignity to relationships between parties. If you just crack open the prophetic books of Scripture, you will see that the prof Hebrew prophets are not respectful, composed, dignified. They dedicate themselves body and soul to decrying the sins that not only erode the social order, but also corrode. Oops, sorry, I thought I turned it off. Okay. Also corrode the relationship between God and the community. Not surprisingly, therefore, the American political Jeremiah's inspired by the prophetic books are not the model of calm, polite discourse that the preacher to the papal household recommends to Christians in the public square. Is the American tradition of prophetic rhetoric, which aims to, as I'm sure you've heard, speak truth to power, therefore uncivil? In my view, it can be, but it is not necessarily uncivil 
provided that we don't reduce the meaning of the word uncivil to not nice. At the same time, we cannot assume that American rhetoric of prophetic indictment is always the best way to get at truth. We're talking about prophecy, civility, and truth. So here's what I want to do. First, I want to explain how prophetic rhetoric operates and think about its benefits and its dangers. And then second, I want to come up with some criteria for the, rec for the exercise of what I want to be able to call just prophecy or perhaps even civil prophecy. So let's start with the basics. What is prophetic rhetoric? In his Stobe lectures at Calvin College, the distinguished Protestant ethicist James Gustafson defines prophetic rhetoric as taking the form of moral or religious indictments. It is the word of the Lord proclaimed against the evil and the apostasy of the world and its societies. It, sh it shows in dramatically vivid language just how far the human community has fallen from what it ought to be. So Gustafson thinks these prophetic indictments have three basic characteristics. First, they usually, although not always, address what the prophet perceives to be the root of religious, moral, or social waywardness, not specific instances in which certain policies are judged to be inadequate or wrong. And you can see you can even see, you know, how this can get twisted even in the past. You know, the Americans, we had the Tea Party, right? The Boston Tea Party. It was about a tea tax. They were going all prophetic over a tax on tea, and they had to transform it to no taxation without representation. But it really wouldn't have worked, right, to be all prophetic saying we're paying too much for our tea. No taxation without representation sounds like a fundamental point. You know, no tea over five pence, not so much, right? So prof second, prophetic discourse uses metaphors, language, and symbols that are directed to the heart, not just to the head. The prophet usually does not make an argument. Rather, he demonstrates, according to Gustafson. He shows and he tells, end quote. Finally, as Gustafson notes, prophetic discourse is utopian in nature. Prophets sometimes proclaim and depict an ideal state of affairs which radically contrasts with the terrors and the horrors of the actual state of affairs in which we live together in society. But they don't often tell you about how to get from where we are, the terrible state we're in, to that utopian vision. They're not good on follow through and planning. They're much better on negative indictment. Are prophets liberal or conservative? Both. Or maybe neither. As I said before, they are radicals. They want to get to the root of the problem that they believe is harming the society in which we live. So how does prophetic rhetoric function? Well, the best way to grasp that is to hear a little bit of prophetic rhetoric from the people that did it best, the actual prophets, Hebrew prophets. Consider this passage from Hosea. Protest against your mother, protest, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. Let her remove her harlotry from between, from before her, her adultery from between her breasts, or I will strip her naked, leaving her as on the day of her birth. I will make her like the desert, reduce her to an arid land, and slay her with her thirst. There you go. Um... Second passage from Isaiah, often used by uh, people who try to model themselves on prophetic rhetoric. The Lord rises to accuse, standing to try his people. The Lord enters into judgment with his people's elders and princes. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The loot wrested from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? and grinding down the poor 
when they look to you, says the Lord, the God of hosts. The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with necks outstretched, ogling and mincing as they go, their anklets tinkling with every step, the Lord shall cover the scalps of Zion's daughters with scabs, and the Lord shall bear their heads. There you go. Prophetic rhetoric. So how do we think about what its functions are? Well, if you step back for a minute and look at the rhetoric, it appears that there are two types of functions. First, it's a demand that wayward citizens make a renewed commitment to the moral basis of the community. In the cases of the Israelites, a renewed commitment to the covenant with the one true God. And there are two aspects of that covenant that the passage from Hosea and the passage from Isaiah kind of indicated. One is, thou shalt have, I am thy, uh, your God and thou shalt have no other gods before me. So Hosea, the whole book of Hosea and the analogy to adultery was meant to symbolize the adultery of God's people by worshiping other gods instead of their God, Yahweh. And then the second fundamental element of that covenant was commitment to the well-being of the poor and the marginalized, not seeing themselves as able to act rapaciously and to take advantage of those who were desperate and poor. So you will see, if you look through most of the Hebrew books of the Hebrew Bible, these are the themes that keep coming up again and again, a, a moving away from the covenant with God, particularly by worshiping other gods, and second, uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know excess of living at the expense of those who are very vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. So that's one element of prophetic discourse. But you could achieve that more or less by writing a position paper, right? You know, here's the covenant, here here you go, here's the covenant, here's the provision, you know, be, nice, be better to the poor and don't worship other gods. Prophetic rhetoric does something else. It shocks the wayward members of the community out of their indifference to their own flagrant patterns of sin and the harm that those sins cause to other members of the community. So prophetic rhetoric is designed to indict and it's designed to shock people out of their complacence in their own sins. And this is understandable. If a society is threatening to abandon key elements of its entire moral framework, or if its members manifest a pattern of sustained indifference to human injustice, prophetic indictment may be the only verbal medicine strong enough to overcome the threat to its moral fabric. So that's what can be said for it. But strong medicine is also dangerous medicine. And this, I think, is the key point of, of, of my talk. It's medicine, but it can be dangerous. So I think of prophetic rhetoric as kind of like moral chemotherapy. Anybody who has had cancer and has had chemotherapy or who has loved somebody who's gone through that process knows that chemotherapy can be essential in targeting a lethal threat to the body. But it can also be extremely dangerous. It can bring you within the patient, within, you know, uh, within inches of death's door itself. You don't just use chemotherapy to target any bad cell in the community, uh, in, in the body rather, in the body politic, because it can often do more harm than good. And physicians, oncologists, will weigh the dangers of the medicine against the lethal threat that it's targeting in deciding whether to use it. So when we think about prophetic rhetoric, I think we have to recognize as well that strong medicine is dangerous rhetoric, uh, medicine, and to assess its costs and benefits as if we're being physicians for the body politic, not for a particular human body. What are the dangers of prophetic indictment? Well, one, you've got a loss of nuance, right? The language of prophetic indictment is black and white. There's no room for shades of gray in its assessment of situations 
or of the people who bring those situations about. Second, it's very often, imagine yourself being on the receiving end of what I just read you, ad hominem in nature. An indictment is fundamentally a criminal complaint, a charge that certain persons are breaking the fundamental law of the community. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to make these charges without directly attacking the, the target, without directly attacking the, the uh, defendant, who is often the audience. Moreover, like a criminal indictment, there's virtually no room to interpret the, the defendant's behavior charitably. And by no room, I mean almost no conversational room. It'd be very hard to be see one of those daughters of Israel and say, well, you know, I didn't actually buy the tinkling anklet. I inherited it from my great grandmother and I spend, you know, hours working at the, you know, at the Israelite soup kitchen on, you know, on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You don't have the room to push back. You've just got the wall of indictment coming at you. The third problem, I think, is the loss of nuance and ad hominem nature of prophetic indictments conjoined to produce what's very often a dualistic worldview. The righteous versus the damned, the evil versus the good versus the evil, the culture of life versus the culture of death. The issues uh, the, uh, those issuing prophetic indictments align themselves with a transcendentally correct cause, God's cause, and those opposing them, uh, they place with the opponents of God. This makes it very hard to cooperate, not simply on the particular issue that's at stake, but also on other issues that aren't related to it. Um, you don't make common cause on anything with people you consider to be minions of the culture of death, say, you know, the one phrase that comes up in the abortion debate, on the one hand, or hateful bigots, a phrase that comes up on the other side in the, in the gay marriage debate. You can only think of these as people to be defeated and marginalized in the course of the society. Third, uh, fourth, um, very often prophetic indictments uh, give rise to a thwarted plan of positive reform. As Gustafson notes, prophetic indictments are essentially negative in fun function. They condemn situations of entrenched injustice without necessarily proposing a way to ameliorate them. And not surprisingly, it can be difficult for those who are opposed to a social evil to agree on what the best approach is to deal with it. And the habits of prophetic thinking can serve a cause less well in the positive moments of social reform because it leads people to treat those who advocate different strategies for reform, which invariably involve balancing some sense of what can be realistically accomplished, as engaged in acts of betrayal. So if somebody doesn't have the same strategy for fixing a problem, it's easy to treat them as really not seeing the problem as a problem in the first place. And so then you have a crumbling uh, coalition to put together a positive change. Fifth problem is dueling profits and public tune-out. Social battles typically include profits on both sides of issues as our current debates over abortion and gay marriage show. Each group feeds off the other's energy. At the same time, I think the ferocity of the battle encourages many people, I call them in the muddled middle, to back away slowly from the debate and from the discussion for fear of becoming collateral damage. You open your, your mouth and ask any form of question, you express any doubt, you're immediately seen as a target. So in the American context, what this can leave is a large group of people who are afraid actually to discuss the issue because they're going to get uh, slammed by the prophets on either side. I actually think that the prophets on either side of an issue, the activists on either side, doesn't matter what issue, have more grudging respect for those on the other side than they do for the muddled middle because at least their opponents recognize how important this particular issue is and how absolute it is. Whereas the muddled middle are just like salt that's lost its flavor. Um, you know, got a, got a different flavor on the other side, but the, the, I, I've seen this um, quite frequently in, in my research for this book. 
And then sixth, the other problem, and the last problem I want to identify is the temptations for misuse of prophetic rhetoric. Precisely because it's very powerful language and rhetorically aligns the person deploying it with God, it can be tempting to use it to win an argument over a matter that really isn't a fit subject for prophetic indictment such as, say, a matter that is not really of fundamental moral and political importance or a matter on which a strategic path uh, to pursue uh, is, 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 is being discussed and debated in order to ameliorate a harm. It's the equivalent of, um, I remember once seeing... Uh, in my travels through uh, divinity school, you know, uh, you know, kind of a guide to preaching. And one preacher said, point weak, bang on pulpit. So, you know, I mean, if the reason you're using your prophetic rhetoric is because your point is weak, you're really misusing the genre. So is prophetic rhetoric civil or uncivil? Well, as I said before, it's definitely not nice. Nobody's going to give Hosea or Isaiah the Mr. Congeniality Award. It's definitely not polite either. It doesn't maintain the social conventions designed to ensure that people who live together in society don't ruffle one another's feathers. It is not non-intrusive. It is not self-effacing. In fact, it's quite the opposite. But that doesn't mean it's not civil. The root of the word civil, after all, is chivis, which means citizen in Latin. The term is also related to civitas, which means city or city-state. It pertains to our civic duty. By calling attention to fundamental breaches in their civic order, at their best, those who engage in the rhetoric of prophetic indictment are profoundly civil. The key is... What does it mean to be at their best? We have to do a little bit of qualifying here. The Hebrew prophets in the Jewish and the Christian traditions were, are treated as direct witnesses and messengers of God. Those who use the language of prophetic indictment in American political life may think they are doing the work of God, but they are not actually and literally direct witnesses commissioned by God to deliver a, me a message. They choose, they make a choice to use that form of communication. What should guide their choice? Let me back up and say, you know, if you have a prophet who's truly commissioned by God, obviously anything I'm saying, you know, is off. You know, you just go and deliver the message God gave you. But when you're choosing to phrase your method in terms of prophetic rhetoric, you have to make some decisions. And I think those deciding whether or not to use this kind of rhetoric need to um, be cognizant of three things. One, the purposes of prophetic rhetoric, which I just talked about. And second, the inherent dangers of prophetic rhetoric, even when it's used for a good cause, and the temptations to misuse prophetic rhetoric. So the upshot is that prophetic rhetoric is not uncivil in itself. Using prophetic rhetoric on the wrong occasions or for the wrong reasons or without due regard for its harmful consequences is uncivil. And I'd like to say that I think the Internet truly exacerbates the damages that we have in all of this, the flame wars on the Internet, the, the kind of, you know, prophets sitting in their boxer shards at 1130 at night, you know, hitting, you know, print or send or, you know, something, you know, are, I, I think we've got a whole different realm that takes the pamphlet wars of, you know, of prior generations to a, to a different level. The key, I think, then, is to develop criteria for just prophecy, and to that task I'd like to turn now. How are we going to develop criteria for just prophecy? Well, I think one way we can do it is to turn to a different metaphor. It's possible to think of prophetic indictment as a kind of verbal warfare, right? It can easily become the equivalent of that, in large part because it configures the social and political context as a culture war. 
We've heard those languages, right? It's a culture war. We're in a culture war. And the prophetic rhetoric, the tools of prophetic indictment are the weapons in that war. It strikes me, therefore, that drawing upon the common Christian patrimony of just war theory might provide some inspiration. More specifically, a just prophecy theory might help tell us something about when and when not a sustained pattern of prophetic rhetoric is justified. And I'm not talking here about you know, the occasional use of a, you know, a, a, a fiery term in the midst of an otherwise civil discussion. I'm talking about a decision to approach and to frame a particular issue in prophetic terms by the part of, uh, of, 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 of a group of people. So how are we going to think about just war theory? Well, just war theory, in, when it comes to bullets, has two components. Use ad bellum which is Latin for the justice that is involved in making the decision to go to war, ad bellum, and jus in bello, which talks about the criteria that decide what's just to do in the course of a war. And in, in the context of one of the chapters of the book, I try to say, well, these criteria can be helpful by analogy in thinking about verbal warfare. We can have criteria of use ad bellum verborum, uh, the use ad going to a war of words, and use in bello verborum, and use the rightness of conduct in a war of words. Now, a good place to get a summary of the just war theory, I mean, it's an old document, it's a so brilliant document. In 1983, the U.S. Uh, Bishops' Conference issued a document called The Challenge of Peace, God's Promise and Our Response, which talked about nuclear warfare and justice and modern warfare. And the, the, the just war criteria are summarized in there. And there are seven use ad bellum criteria identified and two use in bello criteria identified. And I'm just going to give you a few, um, I'm not going to go through all seven criteria, but just give you a couple of hints about how we might think about prophetic discourse in, in, in this kind of analogical way. So let's start with use ad bellum verborum. First criteria of just war theory is just cause. So we can ask ourselves, is the issue that we're about to engage in with prophetic rhetoric really a matter of the fundamental commitments of the community? Is it something that is radical in that sense? Does it go to a fundamental question about who we are as a people? You may have some questions that don't go to that. Say the speed limit, should it be 40 or 45? You know, um, gas taxes, things of that sort. But, you know, other questions do go to that level. Um, And here I think it's important to describe the cause appropriately and not to inflate it. Uh, you know, some people might disagree with me, but I think that re-describing eventually it turned into a big cause, and I'm I'm glad we won and all of that. But uh, I do think that the, or at least at the beginning, re-describing the T tax as no taxation without representation, you know, was a bit of a leap. It really was about the T tax at the beginning, and and so that kind of re-description, you know, maybe not so good. Um, a second criteria is competent authority. Just war theory requires the use of force to be decided upon by those with responsibility for the public order, not for, by private vigilante groups. And it seems to me that we can learn something here. Analogously, um, the ideal, uh, and ideally, the decision to use prophetic rhetoric in the public square ought not to be the decision of an isolated individual or pundit. Those who use such rhetoric ought to be part of a community, formal or informal, that holds itself accountable and the would-be profit accountable for contributing to the discussion and discernment of the common good. And one of the places you can see this, incidentally, um, if you look, study the civil rights movement and some of what uh, what you know Martin Luther King and his and his followers were doing, they held themselves accountable for how they discussed the issues, for how they pursued the issues. They engaged in acts of purification to make sure they weren't just reacting out of anger. 
So one thing that we may ask, you know, if we're involved in groups that use prophetic rhetoric is how are we holding those who use prophetic rhetoric in our name accountable? Who is calling them to think about whether this is the wise thing to do? Um, and you can think about this in terms of church groups, political parties, all sorts of groups. Another criteria that I think is helpful is right intention. Um, the just war theory doesn't simply require a just cause. It also requires a nation to wage war for that cause, not as cover for another cause. So it strikes me that an analogous point in the use of prophetic rhetoric would require self-proclaimed prophets to use their rhetoric for the cause at stake not merely as a means of stirring up people in order to advance another cause. Now, it seems to me, just you know, as a, as a layperson in this, that if you look at political operatives of both major parties, um, we can see that they use prophetic rhetoric on hot-button issues for just such instrumental purposes. They're not using it because they think those issues are truly important. They're using it to stir up the base. Um, so that will give you sort of three criteria from the use ad bellum verborum. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about the two criteria um, in, of use in bellow verborum. And in just war theory, in actual war, there are two things that you need to worry about. One is discrimination. And by that I don't mean discrimination as don't discriminate on the basis of race, religion, and all of that. I mean you have to be careful in who you target. It's impermissible, even in a just war, to target innocent people. And by innocent, they don't mean morally pure and perfect. They mean people who aren't targeting you, non-combatants. That's one criteria of just war theory. The other criteria is proportionality. You can't just say, well, this is a just war. So anything we do in any particular battle, no matter how destructive, is justified by the aim of winning the war. You have to do a proportionality analysis with respect to each tactical maneuver. So you can't say, well, everything I do now is justified by winning, you know, uh, the battle for equality or the battle against abortion or the battle, whatever battle you're talking about. You have to look more immediately. How would this apply more specifically in just uh, war theory about uh, prophetic discourse? I think um, that the principle of discrimination suggests that sustained protests of people with only a tenuous connection to a wrong or of innocence connected to wrongdoers is not morally acceptable. So, for example, and clearly, you could make, expand this, this rules out targeting the children of political combatants um, in their schools or in their homes. And there have been um, activist movements that have protested, uh, you know, the children, say, of, of abortionists or the children of people who are violating... Um, you know, and, uh, environmental activists have gone after children and families, um, you know, in their home setting and in their school setting. Um, I think that that violates the principle of discrimination. You know, children shouldn't be targeted at school. Families shouldn't be targeted at their houses. Keep that kind of target, even in a just prophetic war, you know, at, at the place of work, not taking it to that setting. Secondly, proportionality. Um, so I think that uh, th that requires much more attention to thinking through how a particular, you know, um, use of prophetic rhetoric is going to operate in a particular context, not just using it to justify winning the, the activist war overall. And I don't think you get a lot of attention to that. A lot of people who use prophetic rhetoric feel the need to demonstrate as strongly as they can. And, and, and don't see that under some circumstances, the use of this kind of rhetoric can in fact undermine their own causes by causing harm elsewhere. So you need to think about that. But it's not enough to think substantively about prophetic rhetoric. We also need to think about rhetorical strategies. How do we think about rhetorical strategies? You need to think about style as well as substance. I think the gold standard of American contemporary prophetic speech was Martin Luther King. 
And the criteria that I've taken from for rhetorical or um, strategies is comes from really his use of the prophetic uh, tradition and the Jeremiah. And it's interesting to know that if you can get all the King papers online, and he did as a very young man, a, a, a long paper on the book of Jeremiah, on the prophet Jeremiah. So he's been thinking about this uh, for ages. So here's one criteria, one criterion rather. The biblical model should be the oracles against Israel. That's what biblical scholars call it, not what they call the oracles against the nations. What do I mean here? Well, if you look at the, if you study the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, you'll see that the prophetic oracles come in kind of two general lumps. One lump is the prophets condemning the enemies of Israel for harming Israel. And usually those are utterly destructive oracles. Babylon will be completely destroyed. Not an owl will be heard. There'll be dead bones everywhere, no redemption. And and the prophet usually, there are hints otherwise, but usually isn't too upset about that. It's calling for absolute destruction. And then there's another kind of oracle called the oracles against Israel or oracles against Judah, where the prophet is condemning the sins of his own people. And he's standing with them as he's condemning them. And he's suffering with them as he's condemning them. And he wants them to reform so they can flourish, not to be condemned and utterly destroyed. I sometimes think that if you look around American prophetic rhetoric, we see too much that's modeled on the oracles against nation, calling for the utter destruction of our political opponents, not, um, not the reform. Um, in addition, I would like to say, the best prophetic uh, rhetoric is tempered by lamentations. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it's followed by lamentations. The prophet is sorrowful uh, for the sins, not just angry. He is hurt and broken up that his people are, are, are in this situation. And finally, the best prophetic indictment is tempered and guided by a spirit of reconciled community. I think you see this most in the last paragraph of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing of the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. King held before us, not just the indictment of the sins, but the possibility of reconciling with one another someday. He held us together as a community. He didn't just say we need to wipe out our opponents and repopulate the nation with people who agree with us. There was a transforming that was involved, a repentance and a reform, but not an annihilation. Finally, I think a spirit of humility in prophets is important. It's very counterintuitive in some ways. But even the biblical prophets have an example of the sense that our plans and purposes, our understanding of God's will may not be God's will. The last book shortest book in the in of the prophetic books is the book of Jonah which and you all know about the whale and and that and the book of Jonah is interestingly enough read um on Yom Kippur the day of atonement in its entirety um in 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 Jewish worship services and the book of Jonah isn't just about the whale it's about Jonah delivering a message which looks like he's telling the Ninevites they're going to be destroyed and then lo and behold they end up reforming, and God doesn't destroy them. And Jonah goes off and kind of sulks, really sulks that they weren't destroyed, it appears. And, you know, God, you know, he sits up uh, looking at the city and watching they're not destroyed. He's waiting for the destruction to come. It doesn't come. God grows a, a plant uh, over him, and then the plant destroys. God, Jonah's happy while he's got the plant. Then he's not so happy when the plant withers and dies. And God's using this as an object lesson for his prophet. 
And the Lord says, this is the last bit of Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. That's my favorite passage uh, from the prophetic books because it shows uh, that prophetic indictment is fine. Use of this knowledge to hold people to God's plans and purposes is sometimes extraordinarily necessary. But we need to keep in mind that no human being has a full grasp of God's plans and purposes. And we also need to keep in mind, as God reminded Jonah, that God loves our verbal opponents as made in God's image and likeness uh, as much as God loves us as well. So that's how I think maybe we can think about prophetic indictment in the public square, and I'd be very happy to talk to you about it uh, in questions if you have any. Thank you. I mean, I think the news cycle, the Internet, the need for ratings, the need for sensation is, um, is extraordinarily, um, you know, is creating, you know, many of the problems that we're facing. And, and, and unfortunately, what happens, like if you read an indictment, an actual criminal indictment, it's usually not very nuanced. It's usually putting things in an, ex, you know, sometimes an exaggerated in the worst way. And what happens, I think, is that, you know, people, you know, you can see this in the debates over gay marriage. You can see this in the debates over the HHS mandate. You've got people who are really very, very strongly framing kind of the facts facts of, you know, what the situation is in order to present their indictment. So it's not that you, you very rarely come across just a flat out lie. Um, what you come across is a very, very strong reading that doesn't take into account a lot of the nuances. So just like an indictment, you know, isn't meant, um, you know, to give somebody a nuanced picture of somebody's whole criminal history or, you know, whole history as a human being who committed an act. So these aren't meant to do that either. But the trouble is we don't have a context. I mean, the trouble with an indictment is um, it doesn't create the space to say, well, let's look at this question. Let's look at this pr issue. Um, it, it, it just it wants, you know, an answer. Yes, you did this or no, you didn't do this. So it really kind of works counter to deliberative rhetoric. And I think you're quite right that the Internet and the, and, and the way we're framing this in the 24-hour news cycle are contributing. I'm talking about prophetic indictment, but the Bible is the basis for and, 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 and the way I can kind of critique, but the focus is really not so much the biblical material as much as the Jeremiah, which is a form of American political and religious rhetoric that was rooted, you know, inspired in some sense by, but took off far beyond the Bible, also still rooted in this kind of quality of indictment and still has got some of the basic uh, features of it. And, it, you know, it, it's taken on a secular form. You've got, you know, as I said, Debs and and uh, other figures have used, uh, you know, the Jeremiah. And, you know, I mean, if you read Berkovich's, you know, the American Jeremiah, David Howe Pitney's, the African-American Jeremiah, uh, James Darcy's, um, uh, uh, radical rhetoric and, you know, the, the prophetic tradition and radical rhetoric in America, you can see just how far uh, this whole tradition has been, although it's still rooted in scripture. And what I see the scriptural piece of it is doing is providing a way to generate criteria that can constrain the American Jeremiah, you know, it, criteria that are sort of internal to it. You know, what kind of constraints can we put upon it? So I do think it's important if you, like, look at the, you know, I think, you know, the connection of lamentation and um, and, and indictment, uh, in, in, in especially in the oracles against Israel and Judah versus, you know, what, what you see generally. And I know that there are, you know, exceptions, but generally in the oracles against the nations. So that seems to me to be something that's worthwhile because if you look at, 
say, um, King, you know, you do see much more of, of, of the incorporation of many more nuances. The, the problem I'm trying to explain in the book is if you read Perry Miller's, um, you know, history, two-volume history of the Puritans, what he argues is the Jeremiah was actually a constructive and community-constituting event for those people. But that, you know, obviously it's no longer that. It became something other than that. So what I try to explain is how did it move from being something that was community affirming, something that drew the community together, to something that, you know, in the culture wars is divisive? And what happened in the American tradition is that the notion of the covenant, I think, steadily expanded. So you had the covenant, first off, was the, you know, was the Massachusetts Charter, then it was the second charter, which involved religious freedom, then there was an expansion to try to include, in some sense, all of America. Um, then it became, in some sense, the Constitution became framed as the covenant to which we're responsible. So you've got a very unwieldy covenant, and that's going to generate a lot more, uh, a lot more tension. The, where I see the big fight, actually, is in the controversy over uh, Jeremiah Wright in the, in the, it was a 2008 election. People got so mad at him because he was saying, God damn America. And, and they misunderstood him, I think, as, as talking as if he was out of an oracle against the, uh, the nations rather than weeping at the sins of America in terms of racism and calling for repentance. He was a good biblical pe preacher. Um, but we didn't know how to read the rhetoric anymore. We didn't know how to read our own traditions. But if you go back and you read Jeremiah Wright's sermons in context, it's clear he's got an idea of a covenant. He's standing with all of America. He's not standing against it. And he's weeping for the sin of racism that's destroying the whole country. But he's got some fiery language. Just finished the last chapter of this book, nine chapters, but chapter just like two weeks ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly sick of it. I can't wait to get rid of the whole thing. Um, but the, chapter eight, which has got the criteria, what I end by doing is comparing Martin Luther King's speech which I do think is the gold standard with the, um, you know, in the culture wars, there was a, there's a priest named um, Father Frank Pavone who issued an indictment on the, t against uh, uh, Terry Schiavo's husband and showed, you know, it basically kind of proves your point in terms of how the, there was no design, you know, no attempt to kind of get, it was just a, an attempt not to call for reform, but really to, you know, to indict and to create, you know, kind of a movement. So I think it's, you know, I'm trying to come up with criteria. And I think one of the things I'm trying to grapple with is the fact that in some ways, the American Jeremiah, we're not going to get rid of this kind of speech has kind of gone off the rails in some sense. I'm trying to figure out why. Um, and that, those are some of the criteria. The beginning of the book tries to say it's kind of against McIntyre, Alistair McIntyre, and John Rawls, and, and some of the ethics of civility people that you can't talk about religious you know, or political discourse in America as if it's all deliberative discourse. There's also this tradition of forensic discourse that has to be dealt with on its own terms. And so what I'm trying to do is open up another way of looking at this, not just as a rhetorician. I'm not a scholar of rhetoric primarily. I'm an ethicist um, and, what I, and a lawyer. And I looked at this and I said, yeah, God, this really looks like an indictment. And nobody's trying to, you know, if, if you've ever been indicted, you know, the, the prosecutor is not trying to engage in a deliberation with you. You know, they're trying to convict you. Um, so, uh, but you're right about that. Anybody else? No? Okay, thank you.